Well, hello and welcome to the Glen Abbey United Church service for Sunday, March 14th in the year 2021. This is the fourth Sunday of Lent, and we are so glad that you could be here this morning as we come together as a family in Christ to worship. May the peace of our risen Lord be with us all. Amongst our announcements this week, I'd like to thank everyone involved with the annual general meeting last Sunday after the service, for Tom Budd for chairing, as well as Rob Stapleford's treasurer's reports, and for all who attended to approve this year's budget and review last year as well. So thanks to all of you. Coming up on Tuesday, March 23rd, our outreach committee will be hosting a drop-off food drive there will be no contact, you just drive in near the front entrance, unload your food donations, and that will be taking place Tuesday, March 23rd, so a week from Tuesday, between 9.30 and 11.30. And thanks in advance for your generosity and to Outreach for organizing this. Amongst our occasions, on March the 6th, it was Kathleen Terry's birthday, so happy birthday, Kathleen. And on March 16th is John Fleming's birthday. So a big happy birthday to you, John, as well from all of us. And Yvonne, if you could play happy birthday, please, and let us sing happy birthday to John and Kathleen. So it's been a year, and as undoubtedly the media articles are not going to slow down, as we continue through these times, we need a time away. We need to be able to remove ourselves from the everyday and to approach the throne of God. And so now I invite you to concentrate on the Christ candle, to listen to the music as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Thank you. And we will begin with the call to worship, as you'll find on your screens. We come to this time of worship in different states of mind. Some are weary and worry-laden. Some are hurting and wondering where God is in their pain. Let us worship God. Now, as you're aware, I've made the offer if you have favorite hymns that you'd like to request, and I'll try to work them into the service at some point. This first one today was a request, and it was actually one that I had never heard before. It's interesting how in some churches they become favorites and some never hear them. So we'll be singing hymn number 278 in the quiet curve of evening. Yvonne, choir, please. Silky void of darkness, you 
Let us all join together in the prayer of confession and invocation. Let us pray together. Loving God, you made us in your image with a mind to know you, a heart to love you, and a will to serve you. Sometimes, although we don't want to admit it, we wonder if you hear our prayers. We wonder if you really care for us. We wonder how you can allow such tragedy in this world. We are sorry for the ways of our unfaithfulness and ask for reassurance and forgiveness. Please send your Holy Spirit to mend our broken lives, restore, revive, repair, recreate us in your image. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And the really good news of the gospel is that we can come and confess those things that we think maybe just aren't right in our lives. And God has the power. God has the power to restore any one of us, to revive our lives that may not be going in the right direction, and to repair past transgressions. This is a wonderful thing. This is what we need, and especially during this time of Lent, as we look deeper at our lives and find ways to make them be what God intended. And this is truly good news indeed. Well, I'd better put on my mask, because I imagine my weekly visitor will be here any time. Huh. Where is he? Buford! Buford! Repton, let me sleep, please. But Buford, everybody's waiting for you. What? It's only 9.10, please let me sleep. I'll see you in an hour. But Buford, it's 10.10 now, just like every week. Ten, ten. Did we have a power outage? My clock says nine, ten. No, no, Beaver, no power outage. 
Hey, did we move to Nova Scotia? No, Buford, we're still here in the lovely town of Oakville. Then I still get to sleep another hour. Remember last week I told you that we were going to spring ahead an hour? Oops, I forgot. I'm sorry. Don't worry about it. You're here now, and that's the main thing. Hey, Rev Ted, is this really the anniversary of the pandemic? It sure is, Buford. It's so hard to believe it would last this long. Oh, yeah. Seven long years. Seven? Seven? It's only been a year. Maybe in human years, but in dog years. Seven. Okay, I see your point. But have we learned anything? Yeah, yeah, we need to take good care of each other. And God always takes care of us. You're learning, Buford. Way to go. Hey, I'm pretty awake now. See you next week. Bye, everybody. And this will be our third and last time for our Lent praise song that's so applicable during these times. It's called From the Inside Out by Hillsong United, and you can find the link to it either on the email you received or on our website. Please enjoy it and sing along. Let's bow our heads in prayer, please. Gracious God, coming through these days, coming through this time, we need your wisdom for us. We each have something different than we need to hear, and you know what that is. So Lord, I ask you to please open up our ears and our eyes so you can recognize the word that you have for us, and then open up our hearts and minds so we can take it in, ponder it, and give us the courage to do something about it. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And this morning, I'd like to invite Rose Belcastro, please, for a reading from Acts as well as the psalm. Rose, please. Our first reading is from Acts, chapter 41 to 47. Many of them believed his message and were baptized, and about 3,000 people were added to the group that day. They spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in the fellowship and sharing in the fellowship meals and the prayers. Many miracles and wonders were being done through the apostles and everyone was filled with awe. All the believers continued together in close fellowship and shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money among all according to what each one needed. Day after day, they met as a group in the temple and they had their meals together in their homes, eating with glad and humble hearts, praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And every day, the Lord added to their group those who were being saved. Second reading is from Psalm chapter 63, verses 1 to 8. O oh God, you are my God, and I long for you. My whole being desires you like a dry, worn out, and waterless land. My soul is thirsty for you. Let me see you in the sanctuary. Let me see how mighty and glorious you are. Your constant love is better than life itself. And so I will praise you. I will give you thanks as long as I live. I will raise my hands to you in prayer. My soul will feast 
and satisfied, and I will sing glad songs of praise to you. As I lie in bed, I remember you. All night long, I think of you. Because you have always been my help. In the shadow of your wings, I sing for joy. I cling to you, and your hand keeps me safe. Thanks be to God for the reading of his holy words. Amen. The Word of God. Thanks be to God and thanks to you, Rose, for doing a fine job on the readings. Our focus lesson today comes from Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. And again, we listen to hear God's Word as we hear what the Apostle Paul wrote. You are the people of God. He loved you and chose you for his own. So then you must clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Be tolerant with one another and forgive one another whenever any of you has a complaint against someone else. You must forgive one another just as the Lord has forgiven you. And to all these qualities add love, which binds all things together in perfect unity. The peace that Christ gives us is to guide you in the decisions you make, for it is to this peace that God has called you together in the one body. And be thankful. Christ's message in all its richness must live in your hearts. Teach and instruct one another with all wisdom. Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your heart. Everything you do or say then should be done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ as you give thanks through him to God the Father. And thanks be to God for these holy words. Well, my message today is titled, Why Do We Do That? And whether you're new to participating in church services or have attended thousands of them since birth, there are some things you may have wondered about or perhaps just went with the flow and never wondered, why do we do that? Do you remember years ago when President's Choice introduced the Insider's Report? It went way beyond to be so much more informative than just an everyday grocery flyer would normally be. I used to so look forward to those being published. Well, you can consider today's message to be your insider's report to the weekly worship service. Now, leading experts have concluded that although there are several very good factors that are important to church life, a sense of fellowship and caring, outreach to the community, involvement in good works. The single factor that most influences people as to which church they will choose is the worship service. This has been especially true during this pandemic. Let's face it, time is economic. We have a limited amount of it and we must decide what is valuable enough for us to spend our time on. So it's important that the service be perceived as a valuable use of the time required. And that is also why a lot of time goes into creating each service, so that those who watch and participate will consider it to be time well spent. So let's consider what happens during normal times just before the service begins. Well, going way back to the first century, in Acts 2 that Rose read so well for us, we heard that the first Christians spent their time in learning from the apostles, taking part in fellowship, and sharing in fellowship meals and prayers. Fellowship and sharing meals 
That's been our tradition for thousands of years. In years gone by and in smaller towns, the church was often the hub of the community. And meeting in the narthex before the service was a rare chance to socialize. Now, as we still like to socialize, that's why I suggested making coffee available before the service so we can greet each other in the narthex and get caught up before moving into the sanctuary for worship. The Apostle Paul instructed that the Thessalonians should greet all God's people with a holy kiss. Now, I don't see that happening. However, we do look forward to the day when we can substitute shaking hands and giving hugs again. The worship service is traditionally divided into three sections, gathering, the word, and response. Once a month, we add in the sacrament of Holy Communion, and the sacrament of Holy Baptism is celebrated whenever the opportunity arises. Well, some who are watching may have wondered, why do we do the same order every week? Well, my order has been intentionally refined and tweaked over the years to give a good flow and balance between words and music, and also a balance between God's words to us and our words to God. But the reason we have a consistent order of service is something I learned at Emmanuel College from our renowned worship professor. He taught us, and taught us well, a consistent liturgy or order of service is very beneficial, as instead of people wondering what's coming next, we can clear our minds and concentrate on trying to hear God's word for us in each element of the service. This consistency, it can be comforting for many folks, and especially this past year when the world was often chaotic and out of order, knowing what to expect delivers a familiarity that can be very calming in the midst of the storm. So let's examine each element more closely. We always begin with the welcome, because folks truly are welcome to this service and to be part of this church family, whether in person or watching from home. We then share the peace of Christ with the words, may the peace of our risen Lord be with us all. And this comes from Jesus' own direction to be at peace with everyone before worshiping. The announcements, well, they provide a time of connection to hear about the work and life of the congregation. We might wonder, why do we take time to have spoken announcements if they're included in the newsletter, in email blasts, or in bulletins when we're in person? Well, several years ago at Wellington Square United, we used to find that if you put something in the bulletin for weeks on end, half the people still didn't know about it. But announce it from the pulpit once, and everyone knows. Our celebration time, it demonstrates an important tangible difference between a church family and almost any other gathering of what used to be strangers. If John and Barb Fleming were shopping at Fortino's on the 16th and an announcement came over the PA that it was John's birthday, do you think people would stop to sing or even verbally congratulate him? Highly unlikely. Yet here we truly care about each other, whether it's in times of celebration or times of mourning. Lighting the Christ candle and focusing on the music, it allows us to further separate ourselves from the worries of the world outside the sanctuary and fully concentrate on God, being completely in the moment and ready to receive God's word. Now, the call to worship, it's more than a signal that the actual worship portion of the service is really beginning. 
By being responsive, it brings everyone to engage actively together. This continues as we join together to sing the first hymn. Singing to God didn't really happen in Genesis, but it goes all the way back to Exodus since the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. We read in Exodus, Then Moses and the Israelites sang this song to the Lord. I will sing to the Lord, for he is highly exalted. Both horse and driver he is hurled into the sea. Well, today from Paul's letter to the Colossians we heard, Sing psalms, hymns, and sacred songs. Sing to God with thanksgiving in your hearts. I try to theme each and every service and tie things in together as much as possible to the central theme. So unless you've fallen asleep, you know at the end of the service what that day was all about. When I'm choosing the hymns, consistency with the theme, meaningful lyrics, and singability are all factors that come into play. Now today was an exception, as both hymns today are requests that were made. I had never heard the first one before, but it has a great message for us. Next, we join together again for the prayer of confession and invocation. Confession is good for the soul. Is that line found in the Old Testament or the New Testament? Well, truth be told, it's in neither. It's actually a maxim traced to Scotland in the early 1800s, but that essential message is found so many times in the Bible. Just two Sundays ago, during the psalm, we heard, O oh God, please pardon my sin, for it is great. Now, our Roman Catholic friends go individually to confess, but in our Protestant tradition, we participate as a group and leave the personal confessions between each of us and God. The invocation part of this prayer is calling upon the Holy Spirit to be with us in our worship and our day-to-day -day lives. When I prayed in front of 165,000 people at the NASCAR race in Bristol, Tennessee, that was a prayer of invocation. Then we have the assurance of pardon. Well, when we confess, we also ask for forgiveness, and it is so vital to hear that God forgives so that we will not be afraid to confess. Children are a very important part of our church family, and we always want them to feel cherished, which is why we have a specific part of the service devoted especially to them. Now, when we're in person, before they leave for Sunday school, I prefer that our time at the front be more of a discussion, so that way they feel really comfortable in talking and more attached to the congregation. However, since we've gone online, I still wanted to have a part of the service just for them. And so my conversations with Buford and Marshall and Miss Kitty were born. I sometimes refer to myself as the world's worst ventriloquist. Masking does have some extra advantages. Several of the Psalms, as well as other books in the Bible, say, sing to the Lord a new song. Psalm 98 includes these words, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth, burst into jubilant song with music. And although many of our favorite hymns may have been written between 1860 and 1880, there has been great and faithful music written in the past 30 to 50 years, which we sing as praise songs. I've said before, I realize that not everyone enjoys these songs, but some people love them. And in most megachurches, whose attendance we absolutely marvel at, 
They don't sing hymns at all. They only sing praise songs. Now, some people don't like classical music. Some don't like organ music. Some love it. So by having a praise song along with hymns and the postlude, it allows us to celebrate the full menu of music that is faithful, meaningful, and it fulfills the psalm's direction to sing to the Lord a new song. If we don't recognize when God is trying to speak to us, or we don't take it in and ponder it, then the words are of little use. And that is why during the prayer for illumination, we pray for our ears and eyes to be opened to recognize the words that God wishes each of us to hear and our hearts and minds to be receptive because in Psalm 119 we read, your word is a lamp for my feet, a light for my path. Now most weeks, the scriptures chosen are from the common lectionary where the Bible is broken up into weekly segments that are completed in a three-year cycle. In any church, anywhere in the world that follows the lectionary, you would hear the same verses being read on that particular Sunday. Well, following the lectionary, it makes sermon writing much, much more challenging. But also, more of an adventure, as there are several passages one would rather avoid ever preaching on but they may be the exact words and message that someone in the congregation needs to hear at that time. Now, there's a number of different methods of sermon writing, and two of the most popular are topical and expository. Topical preaching, it's not nearly as challenging as you scan the news, find a topic of interest that you want to comment on, and then find Bible verses that will appear to support your views. Expository preaching is the kind I usually do, where you start with the Word of God for that week, explain what the situation meant in the context of the times it was written, and then endeavor to relate these words to our world and lives today. Truthfully, some weeks it flows easily, and others, It's like pulling teeth. Now, not many people realize that it can take approximately 12 to 16 hours to write a really good sermon, which includes time praying for wisdom, a substantial amount of researching, contemplating, praying some more, structuring it, writing, correcting, polishing, then polishing some more to shorten it down to a manageable length. Yes, that really happens. And then learning it. Well, one of the ministers at my mother's church, she wasn't known for having quality in her sermons. My mom used to think that maybe she made them up in the car on the Sunday morning drive to church. And like with most things in life, the time invested is going to determine the result. While many people have concluded that the message and how it is preached is the key determinant of how a worship service is received, and that's why I invest the most time in preparing the sermons. Now, the conclusion of the sermon is the end of the first two sections, gathering and the word. Now, it's time for our response. The first is offering time. In Acts 2, we read that the early Christians shared their belongings with one another. They would sell their property and possessions and distribute the money amongst all according to what each one needed. Now, don't worry. I'm not going to ask anyone to go that far. But our offerings are more than just a donation to a charity. It's a tangible part of our own affirmation of our developing faith and our heart's desire to help fund God's work 
in this community and right around the world. We then move on to the prayers of the people. These are our words to God after having heard God's word for us. And we're taught that these prayers should not just be asking for things for ourselves, but include adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication, which is making requests on behalf of ourselves and for others. Now, we covered confession at the beginning of the service, so the other parts are handled in this prayer. And no prayer can directly address the wide variety of needs and concerns that individuals will hold. So we also include a time of individual silent prayer for everyone to be able to directly tell God what we specifically need for ourselves or for others, or to add our own personal thanks for all the blessings we've received. Then we say together the Lord's Prayer. During the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6, Jesus said very clearly, when you pray, pray in this manner. And then he gave us the words of the Lord's Prayer, which have been learned by heart and repeated together for almost 2,000 years. In keeping with the instructions to the Colossians, we sing again, a closing hymn. And this usually will tie in with the sermon topic, but again, today's is a specific request. Then I like to do the thank yous. Now, this is not commonly done in every church, or I hear even in most churches, but I truly think that when people are deserving of appreciation and recognition, we should tell them, often. I know the pianist at my previous charge after I'd only been there a month, she said she had never been thanked so much in her life. I think that's a shame. Our singing together always concludes with the beautiful song, Go Now in Peace. And that's our choral blessing. It's a lovely way to close the service, and it amazes me how almost every week the words relate directly to the theme of the service. A marvelous tradition that never gets old. Then, as a reward for sitting through the service, we are treated to a postlude performance by Yvonne and the choir. It's wonderful every single week. Finally, it's time for the final blessing and commissioning, which hopefully gives us something to think about as we make our way out into the world for the week ahead. So there it is, your insider's report to the weekly worship service. And now you know exactly why we do those things. Hopefully, it wasn't too much information. And for this opportunity of coming together as a family in Christ to worship, we sincerely say, thanks be to God. Amen. Well, as mentioned, our offering time is the first response that we give to God. And thank you so much for the way that you have responded, whether it's through pre-authorized remittance, sending in checks, or making donations by e-transfer to donations at glenabbeyunitedchurch.com. We thank you for supporting this ministry. And now let's bow our heads as we ask the blessing upon the donations. Loving God, you have been so very generous to us in our lives and the blessings we have received. We ask now that you receive our gifts of time, of talents, and of treasure so that they may be used to always do your will. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's bow our heads together for the prayers of the people. Let us pray. Generous, 
loving God, we do give you so much thanks for all the good things that we have in our lives. And yes, it's been a year. It's been a very long year. And 12 months ago, if anybody had told us it would last this long, we wouldn't know if we'd be able to survive it. And yet, here we are. With your help, we've gotten through these times, and we look forward to the future days ahead. We think today of all those who have perished or been very, very ill from COVID, and we ask that your blessing be upon those who remain. We pray for those who are having mental difficulty with it, anxiety, and are overburdened. We ask that you lift their burdens and help them through, looking forward to the vaccines being rolled out and an eventual return to normalcy. And we think about also those who have health concerns of any type, whether it's mental, spiritual, emotional, be with them. Be with them and help them to feel better, but also to strengthen those who surround them, to carry them through these times. In each of our lives, we do have individual concerns, and they're different for everybody. But we know that you are always willing to listen. So in the silence of these moments, Lord, we ask, please hear our silent prayers. And when the time is right, no matter which way you choose to speak to us, loving God, we so look forward to your answer. And we thank you for helping us to be able to thrive during this past year and also into the future. We thank you for the many more hearts we've been able to touch than we ever could before. And mainly we thank you for coming into this world as Jesus Christ, who taught us when we pray to pray in this manner, as we all say together the words of the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, as mentioned, our closing hymn this morning is another request. And it may strike some of you that it's one we often hear at baptism time. Well, even though I'm a really good shot with a water gun, I won't be doing any distance baptisms just yet. We'll be saving those for when we can all be together in the building again. But this hymn actually isn't just for baptism. When you're singing the words, think about them. They cover all aspects of our lives and our children's lives. And we thank for the request. It's number 644. I was there to hear your morning cry. Yvonne, choir, please. I was there to hear your morning cry. I'll be there when you are old. I rejoice the day you were baptized. Thank you. 
Thank you to Yvonne and the choir for your music today and for always leading us in the singing and making a joyful noise unto the Lord. Thanks to Rick Sands for his incredible technical abilities in putting together the service every week and making it available to you. Thanks to Pat for distributing it and also to Rose Bell Castro for reading today. But mainly, thanks to all of you for consistently coming together as a family in Christ. We're still connected. One year later, we're still connected and looking forward to being physically together again. And that truly will be a blessing. So we're going to sing Go Now in Peace. That'll be followed by a postlude from Yvonne and the choir. And then I'll be back for the final blessing.
So as we go through these days of Lent, as we go through these times, yes, now we know why we do certain things during a worship service, but let's also consider about why we do certain things in our lives that maybe we need to self-examine and find a path to be able to even improve upon those. And may that incredibly generous love of God, the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the strength and courage and guidance of the Holy Spirit be with us and all whom we love this day and forevermore. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Be strong. Be safe. Keep doing the right things with masking and distancing. And I look forward to seeing you next week. God bless you.